to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today, I got Robert Nickel. He is the founder and CEO of Rocket Station. He is uh, he takes all the fun stuff, all the outsourcing stuff. So thank you, Robert, for being here. I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, that's exactly it. All the all the sexy stuff of building and growing a business that nobody likes to do. That's that's what we're experts in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I uh, I've tried um, you know, hor- horrible at hiring myself and my team. Even and I know you use a lot of stuff outsourcing in the Philippines, and I've uh, tried to hire in the Philippines. One, I tried to hire in India. I tried in, Me- in Mexico. Now I actually think I have someone good through the Philippines. But it's actually instead of doing a solo person, I went through a company, and the company kind of trains them, keeps them going. So it's very, I think it's very difficult to 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 be there. Yet they're very competent in what they do. It's a matter of the training process of it all. Yeah, I mean, it's we believe that the hiring process, if you're going to have success, like for us, we define success by when somebody is placed with an account. So an employee gets placed with their their new home, their new work home. Is that success first time and how long are they there? So if they're not there at least for six months on that first placement, we view that as an unsuccessful placement. And really we mark that as a year. So we want somebody on the first try to stick for a year. And we have about a 98% success rate with over 700 team members working with clients across the country. And we we're managing about 1200 people. And we think the process to be successful hiring is the same, whether you're hiring an internal team member to work inside your office, or you're going to hire a virtual team member, virtual staff, or virtual assistant through through a company that you use, somebody like us. Uh, we think the process is the same, and and but success is definitely possible if you do follow a process. Yeah, it was definitely something shocking. I, I did a, a year in Afghanistan. I worked with um, uh, individuals from the Philippines, and we conversed, we did work together when I was there in Afghanistan with them. And then trying to find that same level of, of clientele, individual, things like that. It was it was very difficult, but the, I think the hiring process was really big uh, for myself. I mean, for yourself, I know your background's in real estate. What got you into, into this world of outsourcing? Yeah, I pretty similar story to a lot of entrepreneurs. I after college, I wanted to work for myself and I thought this idea of starting my own business and not working for somebody else was going to be this dream and create this lifestyle that that I was really looking for. You know, like right now I'm on, I'm on vacation in Tulum, Mexico and and I wanted to have uh, the lifestyle where I could get up and travel and do the things that I wanted to do. And so that that was really the impetus of me being an entrepreneur is being able to control my own time, build a successful business that I could then spend my time with friends, family, do the, doing the things that I wanted to do. That's, that is just the reason why I jumped into real estate and starting my own business. I thought, you know, real estate wasn't my passion. I wasn't, I wasn't just like, oh man, I'm obsessed with real estate. I had read a lot of books and done a lot of research and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it seemed to me like real estate was going to be the path to passive income and being able to to build a financial legacy for myself. And I jumped in and had a little bit of success, but the truth is I hit a wall pretty quick. I could do three or four transactions a month by myself. And that was me hustling, doing everything. I was the lead manager. I was the transaction partner. I was the disposition manager. I, I did everything from bookkeeping, every single thing in my own business. And it, that, that was my ceiling, three to four transactions a month. And I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And so for me, I just kind of got to this point where I was like, why the heck am I doing what I'm doing? I did not get become an entrepreneur to work 90 hours a week and post on Facebook at 4 a.m. on the treadmill about the hustle and grind. That, that wasn't my purpose and point into getting in that. So I started trying to hire people to work in my real estate business. I knew that I needed some help and I knew that I needed to be able to, to leverage other people's time to grow. So I tried to just hire people. I started with Craigslist um, in 2011. 
had some decent hires and had a, some horrible ones as well. And I, it was a terrible experience for the most part, to be totally honest with you. I was just awful at the entire process. And then I tried friends and family and don't ask me how that went. Cause it was even worse. I like, it was just not a good experience at all. And I went to see my broker and he had a great business and he was a good dad. And he had kind of had all the things that I wanted. He didn't have airplanes and boats and cars and all this super fancy stuff but he had a good real estate office he had a good team that worked for him and every weekend he was his daughter's caddy on the golf course for every tournament that she had and and his son zach liked to build go-karts and and work on things in the shop in the garage and they were doing that all the time and i'll never forget when a tornado came through town he was the first guy filling his truck up with lumber going door to door on a tuesday to rebuild houses and fencing and be part of the community and that's that's the life I wanted. I, I was going to be an entrepreneur to be a good dad or a good brother or a good spouse or, or, you know, I wanted my parents to be proud of me. And that's not where I was. And that's that's not what my business was. So I went to visit my broker and he basically said in um, much harsh, harsher ter terms, I'm not going to listen to you whine and complain because you've got every opportunity in front of you. You just need to figure it out. And that's when I learned about virtual assistants and, and virtual teams and outsourcing because uh, his entire business was essentially outsourced. So his lead managers were based in the Philippines. His transaction coordinators and disposition managers were in the Philippines. His IT teams were in Belarus in the Ukraine. And then his buyers agents and his listing agents were in-house, but that was it. Those were the only people. They didn't even have an in-office admin because they kind of shared those tasks. And then everything was in the Philippines outside of that besides their IT work. And so I wish I could say that it was just my genius idea and it just kind of came to me and I just absorbed the light and knew that outsourcing was the answer, but it was really just struggling as an entrepreneur, struggling as, as a real estate investor, as a real estate agent, and kind of learning from, from my mentors. And I was just super fortunate to have amazing mentors who were great business owners, but even better dads, even better people. And that's what kind of led me down the path in 2011 to start exploring outsourcing and virtual teams. All right. So you talked about the idea that your your mentor, your broker, he um, outsourced a lot of in his business, right? So did you hire his some of his people or did you go through a process that he hired? Did he use a company when he was hiring? Yeah. Was so <laughs> so he used a company. And that yeah, this is I've, I've never even actually told this part of the story before. So happy, happy to do it. So he was using a company and that company made some really big promises. They talked about eight weeks of training. They talked about personality profiling. They talked about doing all the resume screening and background checks and actually calling references and all the things that we all want from an employee. They said that they gave benefits and healthcare and insurance and all of those things. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. So I tried to use the company that he was using and they were essentially lying. I mean, it, it, like, I wish I could find a nicer word than lying, but they basically lied about all, like the training started when someone submitted an application. Like to me, that's, that's not training. That's part of the recruiting and HR process, right? So they lied about their training. They lied about the number of hours that they put in and, and invested in them and the resources, and they didn't actually give them benefits and those types of things. But what happened was the first hire that I made, it was a lead manager. And this is also a part of the story I really tell, but I had hired a lead manager and he was terrible, being totally, terrible. I mean, he was awful. But I went on more listing appointments that week and that month and closed more transactions with a horrible transaction coordinator than when I was doing it myself. So that was the light bulb moment. I was like, man, if this company just did what they said they were gonna do, and I can have better than mediocre team members, then man, what could this do for my business? So that was truly the impetus for starting Rocket Station and creating what we have is essentially someone else making all these promises. And I said, we can go do that. We can figure out that process and create it. I did it for friends and family for about a hundred, a hundred real estate agents and investors for a couple of years through masterminds and groups. And in 2013, we've had so much success for for a couple of years doing it and kind of figured out and perfected the formula that then in 2013, we just went all in and took it to where it is today. When you say lead manager, what did, what did that entail? 
So every time the phone rang, whether it was a sign from, you know, out in yards, because as an agent, we had signs out everywhere, right? So random people driving around calling on those signs. We did a ton of direct mail. So they answered the phone from all of our direct mail leads. We also did a whole lot of PPC and Facebook advertising. And in 2013, 14, 15, there wasn't a ton of that going on. So it was really successful doing the Facebook advertising. So I had to have somebody doing all the messenger, Facebook messenger, doing all the social media, um, checking my Instagram DMs because people were messaging me all the time. So truly all the external communication that was coming into the office, that's what I defined as a lead manager at the beginning. And I had someone kind of take on and absorb every time the phone rang, it was their job to pick it up in real time, answer hundred percent of the calls live. That was really my first step in, into outsourcing was making sure that every single phone call got answered live. All right. So he's, he's doing, or that person's doing that. He's not the greatest, but you're getting more business. He was actually now, terrible. I'll be yeah. like, I would listen to his calls and it was cringe. I mean, I would just cringe the whole time, but I got more listing appointments. I, I went on more appointments and by going on more appointments, I got more contracts. It was just the formula. So that's what I was like, man, if I had somebody good and well-trained, imagine how many more appointments I could go on by this person just being able to field calls effectively. And then how did you go about, because this was a company that you basically went through and they found the person for you. Now, how did you find people that were outside this company then? That were yeah. Good? So it just started, I started grinding at it. So today we're screening 6,000 applications a month yeah. and we're hiring less than 2% of those people, which is how we get the quality that we do. We have massive infrastructure excuse me, massive infrastructure around recruiting, training, staffing. I mean, that is the core of our business, right? But at the, at the beginning, it was me posting ads. At the time, um, it was Upwork and, and um, Indeed. Odesk at, oh. at the time before they merged to come into, not, it was Elance and Odesk at the time, and now oh. they've merged to be Upwork, right? And there was that like Fiverr was still truly, you could get things for $5 and that was kind of it. So I, I was just doing it caveman style. I was posting ads on every job board that I could find. I was posting job descriptions within every Facebook group that I could find. Cause like there's, you go on Facebook, there's a group for anything and that's, that's in every country in the world. Right. So I was just manually posting job descriptions, job ads in every job board, every social media group, everywhere that I could think of get creative to get people to apply. I was just doing it and then I was screening all of those myself. So I created a um, survey monkey resume piece where people could go online and fill out the survey monkey. And then that gave me a little bit of a sense of automation because I was handling so many applicants. And then I just basically hired somebody to screen and filter through applicants. I gave them a checklist of the things we were looking for to, to filter through resumes and, and job descriptions and, and do a little bit of research on their work history. And then I started doing, I would be honest with you, I was doing every single interview at first. I did real estate from, from 8 a.m. to three o'clock in the afternoon. I would take a break from three to four, then from 4 p.m. to midnight, I was one-on-one -on -one training our teams, live seller calls. So I would I would get, I'd share my, my screen on Zoom. We would have a full training class and I was, taking leads all, I mean, taking calls all day, both inbound and outbound. And that's how we taught how to take calls because just giving somebody a script, what are they gonna do? Like that doesn't really teach them anything, right? So that was the process originally. I wanted to create training and structure that was actually effective and that worked. And so at the beginning, it was just me manually doing every bit of it. And once we found something that worked, we automated, created a process around that. We would hire teams to fulfill that. And we just kind of took one step at a time, hiring one person at a time. And ultimately it led to what it is today. When you're talking about multiple people and, and, and growth, so you, you, your first hire that you had uh, outside that company was a person that was screening other hires. Did you have a mindset or idea of how many people you wanted to bring on that would, and then, okay, I'm going to bring on five people and see how it works. Then we're we'll bring on 10 people. Get rid of yeah. Them. So today, yeah, it was, it's really interesting because the way we do it today is nothing like, how I started doing it. And I'll, I'll answer your question directly and what I'll get back to, I promise. The, the way it is today is there's a big team that goes through all of it and it, we have massive, right? Like 6,000 resumes. We're just like, 
it's all there. But originally, I was having to to screen every single person and go through every single thing myself, right? So at the beginning, it was a lot of guessing and a lot of screwed it up. And what I would do is I would hire three, four, five people and hope that two or three of them were good. And then I would just kind of keep the good ones and shuck the bad. That's how it was at the beginning, to be totally candid. And so that it's just kind of, I, I had to get lucky because I didn't have much of a process. I didn't have much of a formula. You were hiring originally for yourself. And then at that point in time, when you started hiring more people, were you hiring for other agents saying, hey, I have someone for you, or are you still yeah. taking the, 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 the top ones for yourself? How was that working? Yeah, I was still taking the top people for myself, but you know, I was a part of mastermind groups and real estate groups, and I felt so much gratitude for having some structure in my business and having some success and people helping me that I wanted to help other people do that too. So a lot of my time, I, I was doing it totally for free at the beginning, helping other people. And the concept was really, hey, if we hire three and you get one really good out, one really good person, in the beginning, we thought that was a, a great way to do it. And, and we just didn't have the infrastructure we had today we didn't have the success rates we have today so to me it, it made sense at the time like if i could hire two and one work or if i hired three and all three of them ended up being great to your point i would give a couple of them to my to my friends or people that were in the business people that needed help and so it was not a super sexy clean process at the beginning it was just kind of hustling grind i was doing it caveman style I would be on listing appointments and my phone would be blown up with people asking me questions about stuff happening, uh, you know, people wanting help. And re and that's really what, what kind of pushed me into starting Rocket Station was we were helping so many people. And my teams that I had hired to run my real estate business were essentially full time training and helping other friends and family and people that were in real estate build their staff and their teams. And at first. I mean, just totally honestly, young, dumb and naive. I gave up too much of my time helping other people for free. But that's where I really learned through the grind of, of how to perfect this process. And so I, like I mentioned, I did it for about 100 a, a people, one on one, trained their teams, screened them, recruited, did all the work for them, handed them a virtual assistant in whatever role they were looking for because I trained them off of my business. And that's part of why real estate went so well. For my bit for me as well is because i had so many bodies so many people you know if you're calling every single person in the neighborhood you're gonna get some appointments right you're gonna get some activity from just brute force effort so there was some win there but it was pretty sloppy at the beginning well was your business changing though too because i would think if you're giving these uh um uh, osas you know to other teams you'd be getting some good referral business too Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I, you know, people talk about karma or whatever. I believe that energy is real and whatever you put out into the world resonates and that, you know, talk about manifestation or whatever. How do you create the life that you're looking for? That's through the energy and efforts that, that you make. And so I created a lot of goodwill within the real estate industry in a few years by, by being so giving and really sharing. I mean, there's to this day, there's not a script. I won't just give you like, I'll give you any script. I'll give you any system, any process. And if that can help your business be successful, great. I don't care if you hire our teams or not. Our mission as a company is enhance lives through better business. It's not everybody hire our teams. That's that's not the core. That's not our core values. That's not our mission. We're not a perfect fit for everyone, but we've got resources for for anybody. And that's how I felt from the very beginning. If I could share anything that helped your business, because most people like you're talking about an OSA. Like it's easy for you to answer the phone. It's easy for you to talk to somebody. You don't even think about it, right? You just kind of like go through and you grind through and all of a sudden you know what to say. Like, how do you know what to say to somebody else? You just know. But if you're gonna train somebody, if you're gonna have somebody fill that role, they need a well-written script and process to go through. They can't just guess and they're not just gonna know things. So all of those things, I felt so much gratitude and joy, grateful to to have all those things in my business. So even to this day, we share and give all of our systems, all of our process maps, all of our scripts, anything that we have, we're happy to share those things. And if it can make somebody successful, then then that's kind of the best thing about what what I get to do every day. So I've always had that sense of gratitude and, and willingness to share and give. 
I wish I could say that it was all good for my business. There was, I mean, I, there was a lot of times where I was giving too much of my time and it really hurt. Uh, my, my real estate business suffered as a result, but on the staffing and virtual assistant business, it was always all positive. And I'm just so grateful for how it went today. But yeah, it, it was, it was some ebbs and flows with, with both sides of the business, both the real estate and the, the staffing business. Being that the, the real estate was your, prime breadwinner right your golden goose and then it slowly started i mean dwindling a little bit while your other platform was was really becoming the golden goose i mean yeah. do you ever have any thoughts in that transition period of saying i need to step away from the um uh, the, the osa stuff and focus more on my real estate yeah, it was a battle all the time, you know, meeting payroll every couple of weeks. And what really happened, the best thing that ever happened for my business was I, I went through a divorce. So my ex-wife and I separated and through that divorce process, she got most of the real estate. The real estate business essentially was dissolved. And I pretty much went full full time into the staffing business at that time. And before then, both businesses were suffering because for me, to split my time and split my energy between multiple businesses. I was kind of fooling myself thinking that I could do that, but I was overwhelmed. I was burning the candle at, at both ends. I was going to bed at night, feeling anxiety because I wasn't getting enough done. And I'm waking up in the morning, hair on fire, trying to go go crush it and, and get more done. So for my business, for the rocket station and for the virtual assistant business, the best thing that ever happened was my, my ability to be able to focus and just have a single single mission and one of my favorite stories ever is uh when warren buffett and bill gates they're great friends and they met for one of the first times and bill gates's dad was there and he asked them to both write down individually without talking to each other what was the one key to their success if they had to boil it down to one thing what made them successful and they both wrote down the same word they turned it over and it said focus both of them had used that word focus and for me that was the blessing the separation of my divorce was my ability to now focus on one single business. And we we really took off at that time because we were able to serve at a much deeper, much more impactful level. And the results were just, just incredible. So again, I wish I had some super cool story about how I just learned these things and knew they're like read it from a book or something and just went implemented because I'm smart or something like that. But it was really just a painful process that I had to kind of learn through the grind and get my teeth kicked in a little bit. And then learning how to focus on on one thing in one business is really what I attribute Rocket Station success. Well, today it's because of our team, but at the time it was because I was able to give my team what we needed. Do you, uh, and you brought the idea of focus and, and you, you kind of zoom through the, the idea of the divorce. And I mean, I had a couple people come on here and talk about when they were starting their business and business, putting their business together, the time they put into their business and then they kind of weed into it that the divorce happened. Do you think the focus that you had in building these two companies played a factor into the divorce? Oh, without a doubt. I was totally out of control there for a while. And both that was the case for both businesses. They were they were both out of control. We had too many moving parts and too many things that were moving, too many variables all the time. And so I, you know, to to establish a relationship with anybody. I think we might have lost robert right there so we'll see if he if i'm he sorry log, logs back in but there you go robert yeah we lost you so i'm sorry uh, about that oh no you're, you're probably fine now um so you're talking about the idea of the the relationship and playing a factor and um i'm not sure where we finished but we'll, i'll just jump into this question i'll transition over to this question do you think if someone's right now is gung-ho about building a business right and they had the mindset you had of building a business and they're in a relationship that they they really care for. What kind of advice would you provide to them so they could have a powerful business and a powerful relationship? Yeah, I think being present is the key. And that's kind of what I was the point of the last question was being present is the foundation to any relationship, in my opinion. And so if, if you're going to I was working all the time when I was at dinner at home, I'm on my phone, I'm on Zoom or whatever it is working, I never turned it off. There was never a moment in my personal relationship that I was ever present because I was always thinking about the business. It was my only focus at the, or really two businesses, keeping them 
afloat and trying to survive there. So, I mean, I, the only, I don't, you know, advice, like who am I to give advice, but the only advice I really have is just if wherever you are, be present. And if you're, you're setting time aside for your personal relationships, which I highly recommend to do, be present in those moments and invest in those relationships. And to me, that's the only way to have a successful relationship in, in any real meaningful way. So I think it's a choice. I think we all create the exact life uh, that, that we're looking for. I don't think we're in, any of us are really victims to, to our circumstances. For the most part, I think we, we kind of create the lives that, that we intend to. So if, you're, if you want a really healthy, strong relationship with the spouse or significant other, I think just making the choice to be present in the times that you're choosing to dedicate to those relationships will, will make all the difference in the world. Going back to the building your uh, business, building Rocket Station, I mean, one of the, the, the big things that, that I know I failed and I've talked to other people is, and, and anyone listening right now has probably got the phone call where as soon as you hear the, the heart, the really strong accent, you go, okay, uh, I'm going to hang up this phone and I'm done with this call. How, oh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate getting those calls. Okay. So how do you get past that, that conversation? Because there, I think there's stuff there. Because, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people in the Philippines, and the, sometimes the access is not there. Or it, it, there's, like, just small nuances that you kind of you can kind of take away that you know they're not local. So how do you Yeah, there's two, there's two things there, right? The, the initial thought that most people have, and it's totally valid, I do, was, was English proficiency. And we talked about the first – uh, sales rep that I hired to, to work the leads, he spoke perfectly clear English. His English was, you would have no idea if you were talking to him that he wasn't sitting in California or something. I mean, his English was perfect, but he was terrible on the phones. Why was he terrible on the phones? Because he was a terrible communicator. His communication skills were awful. So yes, they need to speak really strong English. English proficiency is obviously key. But the United States is a melting pot. I mean, like, what is English proficiency? When you're in Mississippi, Louisiana, the South, that is not the same English as when you're in the Northeast. And it's definitely not the same as the West Coast. And then through the middle part of the country, it's pretty uniform from, you know, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, those parts of the country. Oh, it's pretty similar. So what is the real differentiator there? And we've seen it over and over and over again through our success rate. It's all about communication skills with the right English proficiency. So we absolutely screen as part of our process for English proficiency. It's the number one box we've got to check because every single person wants and needs and deserves somebody that works for their company that speaks great English. So that that's obviously the first requirement to ever even get into the pipeline. But what's equally as important, and I argue much more important than English proficiency, is your ability to communicate. And part of that communication skills, now it's the person and the training that they're going through. So if you get the right person who's got the right skills and then pair that with time, energy, and effort in the right training platform, now you've got dynamite. Now you've got perfection. So it, it really is about having a true understanding of what you're trying to, to get. So, for example, a back office support, accounting and bookkeeping, is English proficiency the primary concern? They've got to be able to communicate well. They have to be able to function and feel just like an employee in your office. But really, they've got to be able to perform the level or a high level and perform those tasks really, really well. So it's a multi-step process. It's very complicated and there's a few few angles to take for almost any role. But that's why we we force everybody to go through the same process. Whether you're a publicly traded company, we work with publicly traded companies, both in the real estate space, SaaS uh, space, and, and lots of others. And then we have solo entrepreneurs and everybody in between. And the process is the same. The first thing you have to do is go through an alignment phase and allow us to document your systems and processes, which is the first step, which creates the job description. So long before we're creating job description or hiring anybody, we're documenting and itemizing every SOP and every task that's happening within your business, within your organization, so that we can then from data create great job descriptions. You talked about like at the beginning. How, how did you hire? At the beginning, I just hired three people and hopefully one of them worked out and then I got rid of the other two. Today, it's based on data. How many phone calls are coming in? What's the average call handling time? And most real estate offices, it's about five and a half minutes 
on any fresh lead that comes into the office. And that's pretty much a national stat, right? So five and a half minutes, how many of those calls are coming in? What's the average work time? So if you call that, you know, six minutes and 15 seconds between taking notes, closing out the ticket and moving on to the next call, it should be a data driven process into how many people are filling those roles. So there's no guessing on the number of people and there's no guessing on who the right person is because we're gonna go through a really systematic approach to make sure that the structure and the foundation is there to know what exactly this person's gonna be doing. What does success look like in this role? How are we defining success? Do we have an accurate job description and training manual built for that role? Now let's go find the right person to fill that seat and go crush their job. So to us, that is the formula to go through. And it doesn't matter whether you're hiring an OSA and a, a bookkeeper or a disposition manager, that, that is the process to be successful. How long have you had uh, um, um, outsourced in the Philippines? Since 2013. Okay. And how many times have you been to the Philippines physically? Four to five times a year, every year, okay, except so you- for last year because of COVID. Okay, so when did you actually, because it's you were hiring a lot of people, and then basically when you originally started, and then knocked away basically the, the bottom two, right, out of the three, and you're probably doing that for a little while, but when did you go, okay, I'm going to go out to the Philippines, because I want to get, you know, I mean, boots on the, on the ground. I had nine or 11 people, something like that. I was right around 10 people. Okay. And we were, and, and when I say 10, that was basically 10 managers. So these are people I was working with every single day that were then managing three or four people. So once I had a little bit of infrastructure, at first I was just paying through PayPal or sending MoneyGram, Western Union. I mean, I was doing all, all those types of things. And I wanted to provide my team members with insurance and benefits and healthcare and all the things that any employee needs to be consistent and stable and, and massively productive like you you've got to walk into your home and and your spouse needs to be proud of you and your kids need to be proud and you need to feel fulfilled and you need to have all the benefits that every employee deserves and so i wanted to provide that to my team members i wanted them to have great banking relationships i wanted them to get discounts on their auto and home loans because of the resources we could provide through through having a little bit of scale so Pretty early on, I was interested in, in providing enough benefits and resources that, that that's why I went over there. And the second part of that was I wanted to give back to the community. So our community cares projects are my favorite thing and what I actually care most about. So those those are really the two reasons why I went over there at the beginning. Well, how did you even know where to, where to start in the Philippines? Who, who... Yeah, so the honest answer is one of the people I hired was a total rock star, is a total rock star, is with me forever. And um, through her, I navigate, I would ask her to set up me. So during the, because obviously it's a, it's a, they're flipped, their time zones flip, they're 13 hours ahead of us here in Central Time for the most time of the year, minus daylight savings, right? So I was really hard for me to get stuff done during Philippine business hours because that was nighttime in the United States. So I really had some amazing team members and leveraged some of them to really spend the time to to set up meetings. So when I went to the Philippines the first couple of times, my entire trip was essentially scheduled before I even went over there. I, I had it all lined up so that I could be really efficient when I was over there. I met with all the major banks. I met with tons of attorneys. I met with all, because I wanted to have a legitimate thing. I wanted to be able to put the word out. I wanted people to join Rocket Station and I wanted to be a community of, of like-minded, successful people that were looking for great jobs, great careers to join it. So I, I really wanted to have all that done correctly. And I just leveraged people that were over there. It's just like, I mean, Google's an amazing tool. So between having some team members already there and then just being able to, to Google some resources and, and overlap the two. And then after a lot of effort going over there four or five times a year, things start, you know, just happening or falling into place. You know, those serendipitous relationships start, start kind of falling into place once I was able to kind of get over there and start making it happen. If we're talking, let's say in five years from now, where do you see uh, Rocket Station going? Yeah, so we're going to just basically continue on the same path we're, we're going now, just expand it. So right now, probably 65% of our client base is all real estate. And we're going to continue to drive real estate. And that'll be a big part. But 
we're we're doing well in other industries and other spaces. So we will continue to specialize and, and have niche projects with the, you know, real estate's its own space, its own industry. So we want teams that are dedicated and focused to real estate. And SaaS software companies are are kind of their own beast. So we have dedicated teams. So right now we have about 1,200 people under management total, and, and we doubled last year so we're twice as big as we're the year before and we're on pace to do that again we're hitting about 10 percent month over month growth so i'm looking to just stay really focused for the next three to five years on our core competency which we only do two things we document systems and processes and we have dedicated team members that that work for our clients and so we will continue to do that but in five years the the thing that will really have changed as i mentioned rocket station cares our, our community works projects that will be significantly bigger so that is led by our teams they get to create uh the the project so whether that's healthcare projects whether that's sponsoring schools whether that's just investing in communities in different levels like the teams get to come up with that as a company we support that we lead those those uh projects and then it's totally volunteer opportunity for all the team members and they love it so for me that is the most fun thing about what i do it's the most fulfilling part about what we do so those community works projects in five years will be a huge part of our marketing and our resources because that's where all of our our energy really goes and it's mostly because that's what gives me fulfillment and joy and pleasure to to give back to the teams and communities and to see the joy that brings to to our internal team members so that is really what I see changing is just our ability to invest more in, in the community. If let's say an entrepreneur and I'm going to, I'll finish off with this question. If you, if let's say an entrepreneur is listening, I mean, they're getting excited about growing their brand, growing their business. What's one of the biggest uh, pieces they can leverage in their business by outsourcing, right? Be it out, inbound sales calls, outbound sales calls, customer service, payroll, whatever it might be, marketing, what's the biggest one, at least have you seen, that will get the, yeah. the quickest results? Yeah, I think the first place to start is always to look at if, if you're a solo entrepreneur, where you're spending your time all day. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day. And so revenue generating activities, in my opinion, are the primary role of the, the solo entrepreneur. So listing appointments, showing properties, doing things that actually carry it from contract to close. The things that actually generate revenue are, are usually, in my opinion, the primary task that the, the entrepreneur needs to be doing is just making sure that cash is, that checks are cash and there's actually revenue flowing. So what, what should be outsourced and what should be delegated should be all the supporting tasks so that the highest and best use of that entrepreneur, or if you have a couple team members, what we see so, so often is those team members get overwhelmed with day-to-day -day ancillary tasks that are absolutely important. They have to get done, but are they the highest and best use of an internal team member's time? Is that exactly why you're hiring somebody internally in your office is to, to do, no, you want them to be utilized. You want them to be insanely productive and you want them to be as efficient as possible. So. For us, where we like to start usually is outlining what's highest and best use of, of our client's time. Like let's literally put them where they've got two to three tasks on their checklist every single day, because those are the primary, most important things for them to do. And then the rest of the things that are super time consuming, they have to get done, but not the highest and best use of your time. That's where we start building systems and process maps to start delegating and outsourcing those tasks. Does that answer your question? Did it answer your question? I, I think there's a lot of things to take away. I think the, the biggest thing that I'd probably jump on the, the first one was probably money making activities because that's probably going to allow you to keep pushing that there, just like you saw in your own business, right? Money making activities, you saw more money coming in. So you go, hey, you know what? This is working. It's it makes it simpler there. When they're doing activities that might not be money making activities, but could provide growth in six months to a year to two years. You might look at the books and go, I'm not really getting results that I need out of this. Maybe I should look at different directions. So I, I'd probably lean that direction that you originally said. Yeah, it's a lot less of an emotional hurdle when there's enough revenue to provide for the expenses, right? And so it's it's totally valid to have expense concerns in your business. And we never want any business to be overstaffed or over. But at the end of the day, if you don't have any help, then there's just you're just so limited by by what you can do. So it's all I mean, 
almost always, in my opinion, the best place to start is securing the revenue generating activities to strengthen those areas. The, you know, there's, there's lots of books that have lots of crude sayings about revenue, but essentially, you know, it all comes down to revenue cures a lot of problems in the business. A lot of problems go away when there's a little bit more money coming through the door. So if we can start by helping any real estate, uh, whether you're an investor or an agent, by doing a few more transactions, getting a little more revenue in the door, it doesn't take, you know, for, for one VA that's that we're for us. Okay. In our company, if you hire somebody on your own, it'll be less, but for us, it's 10 bucks an hour that comes out to 20 grand a year. So how many transactions do you have to do to make an extra 20 grand a year? For most people, it's not very many. The na the national association of realtors puts out a stat that that's two and a half transactions, but for most people, it's even less, less than that. So, um, yeah, I mean, revenue, revenue solves a lot of problems. So, so if we can help you just do a couple more transactions a year, the team member is now paid for and everything else is just, it's just that delta of a net profit. And so that, that is not some elusive thing. I mean, that, that is very possible for anybody that's willing to just work at a little bit. It is a very, very doable thing. Well, I appreciate you, uh, Robert, being here. Hopefully everyone listening got some great nuggets right there. I mean, I think one of the big takeaways, doesn't matter how well you're doing, be willing to listen to other people. If Robert didn't take that advice of his broker and listen, he would have been down a fully different rabbit hole. We might have been talking to him about his real estate business instead of his outsourcing business, but he at least listened to, to someone else and didn't think he knew it all. And, and now everything's changed right there. So I appreciate you, Robert, uh, for being here. Thank you for giving all your, your feedback, insight. Uh, and understanding that it was okay that you didn't know how to hire here locally, that you found how to hire globally. Man, I appreciate you having me on. This has been so much fun. And yeah, I I started with none of the answers. We figured a few things out, but it, but I know I've got a lifetime of learning yet. So, but that's part of what's amazing about what I get to do with all of our clients, and we get to support other people's businesses and the learning I get to do through what other entrepreneurs are doing and other business owners is, is just amazing. So I appreciate the compliment. Thank you for, for saying that. And I, I view myself as a lifelong learner and, and, and like to apply those things back into the business because I definitely don't have all the answers. Most of my learning, unfortunately, has come from just grinding and get my teeth kicked in. I, I don't really have a, a better process than that. So pain is is my best teacher. And then I pass those lessons on to our clients so that they don't experience the same pain. <laughs> pain is gain. Thank you, guys. Please subscribe. Please share. Go find uh, Rocket Station and Robert. His information's in the show notes. Bye, guys.